Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me and you can see my screen. Uh, my name is Aran Kinsbrunner. I'm a chief evangelist, uh, senior director at Perforce. And uh, today I'm excited to talk to you about how you can achieve, uh, with a few of my tips, um, uh, a winning strategy in con for continuous testing in DevOps. <clears throat> A word about myself, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a chief evangelist uh, at Perforce. I'm a blogger, inventor, and also a wor worldwide speaker with over 21 years of experience in software development and testing. You can find me on social if you aren't uh, already connected with me. Uh, feel free to continue this conversation also after uh, my session. I'm also the author of these uh, three books, um, and most of these books kind of uh, touches a lot of my best practices that I'm going to uh, give to you uh, in my session today. Before I talk about continuous testing, since I'm uh, specialized in, uh, you know, digital uh, testing of both mobile and web applications, uh, I just wanted to highlight a few things that, uh, you know, you should be aware of because we are in, mid, in the middle of 2021 already, and there are a few disruptions happening in our digital landscape, especially on the mobile and web front, uh, starting with the Apple uh, app clips. These are kind of a subset of the iOS applications that you don't need to install through the App Store, but really kind of um, a, snap, a snapshot or a snippet of a native app that gives you the taste to really chase the full native application. But this is a full uh technology uh, or a new technology that you need to be aware of if you are online on the mo working on the mobile space whether if you are a developer or a tester uh on the android by the way i'm not going to go by the order of the slide uh you see the android apks the apks are also a new form of mobile applications and this is kind of a, an app bundle as uh, google called them uh, or a zip file that consists of many uh, Android APK binaries that you need to take care of, obviously, but uh, this is not a kind of a recommendation. This is a mandatory requirement from Google, and they are going to enforce it starting August 1st. Any new application going to the Google Play in less than three months will need to be in the template and format of APKS, and it's going to be, again, a list of m multiple native mobile applications for Android, and they will be deployed automatically based on a configuration file on specific devices with specific capabilities, sometimes also on specific geos, geographies. So uh, app clips, APKS are two important trends that you need to know, know about. The other ones are obviously the rise of foldables, the rise of progressive web applications, which is still uh, a web that transforms uh, into a more uh, mobile ready application. Again, uh, written in JavaScript, or other web technologies, and it's not written in the native mobile operating system technologies, but this is uh, a new wave of digital apps that we are seeing. And it's important because you, you ask me, okay, so why, why is that important for continuous testing? So let's say if you are testing today uh, a web application uh, or a mobile application, this is uh, exactly what's going to disrupt or add complexity to your existing testing, okay? The other th things that I'm seeing in the market uh, uh, in this short intro, uh, obviously, are uh, the uh, complexities in big data analysis. Uh, as we do continuous testing, as we uh, run a lot of tests, we generate a lot of test data. This test data needs to be easily uh, filtered, easily sliced and diced, so you can make uh, informative decisions uh, going forward. For that, we are seeing the rise of uh, smart analysis or test impact analysis, allowing teams to be much smarter throughout the cycle from one iteration to the next. Last but not least is also the, con the standardization around test automation frameworks on mobile and on web. And here you see uh, on the mobile front, you see Flutter, Espresso, XUI, Test, and Appium. On mobile, it's obviously, oh, sorry, on web, uh, it's Selenium for ages with uh, Cypress coming to really challenge Selenium or maybe run in parallel uh, with Selenium uh, to complement a very good suite of frameworks for the web technologies. 
Another thing that I, I'm seeing is obviously the rise of AI and machine learning. Yesterday, I was uh, part of the panel uh, at DevOps for Europe, and uh, people were asking, okay, so can AI and machine learning help me uh, in my DevOps journey or in my maturity towards DevOps? Uh, and what Deloitte uh, released, uh, I'd say, yeah, it was a, less than a year ago, uh, they released this nice uh, report showing the different use cases as well as the benefits that they are seeing uh, by the use of AI machine learning. You can see just a few things, you know, above the fold, above the 36%, you know, uh, that achieve the outcomes or the benefits were uh, saying that discovering new insights, that's the data analysis, okay? Making employees more productive, that's probably attributed to uh, either automation, uh, automated code reviews, automated testing, automated uh, data analysis, uh, low code, creation, these kind of things. Improving decision making, again, through data, predictive analysis, these kind of things. Enhancing existing product and services, it's also contributing to making the products more innovative, more feature rich, uh, rich of features, because uh, when you put intelligence layer on top of your software, you're able to obviously see much more and make more uh, product uh, unique capabilities, implement product unique capabilities that serves your end users. And obviously at the highest level, make processes more efficient. What I don't see here, and this is usually what the uh, uh, biggest concern uh, of DevOps engineers, testers and everyone is, okay, this is going to steal my job, okay? You see here, there is no use case or any benefit or anything like that against uh, AI machine learning on the on the uh, context of uh, job replacements and stuff like that. It's all about better pro productivity, more efficiency, more automation, data-driven decision making, lowering cost as well. Uh, so this is uh, a nice way of uh, looking at AI machine learning. The reducing headcount here is not to kind of. Uh, uh, throw employees away. It's uh, to reduce headcount in a specific group to make it more efficient. And uh, in most cases, making this uh, uh, redundant headcount be more productive elsewhere within the organization. So it's all kind of, I would say, ramping up uh, in that sense. Last but not least, uh, and we are in a continuous testing session, when you look at uh, AI machine learning, we are seeing a huge transformation uh, in the evolution of testing over the past two decades. And I think that now, if you ask me, uh, we are in a level two uh, maturity model where we're dealing a lot with scriptless or codeless test creation and playback, uh, which is with self-healing, uh, managing the elements locator of the applications. Uh, we are not 100% in the level three. I would say we are between level two and level three, okay, from a maturity standpoint. Uh, we obviously want to reach the level four and five, which is fully autonomous uh, testing abilities. This is when you kind of uh, point the, the engine or the algorithms into a, towards an application, whether it's mobile or web or desktop or a packaged application. And uh, this uh, tool can automatically analyze and create test automation scenarios against this um, application. After this short intro, let's dive into the topic of this uh, session. I just wanted to put some context because, you know, continuous testing, uh, before I define what it is, you know, uh, the most challenging thing about continuous testing is the word continuous, okay? Because, okay, you created a test, you created a, a script or test scenario, what happens after a week? Okay, even if nothing changed on the product, and let's take uh, a web browser or a mobile device, things change on the platforms themselves, okay? How you continuously get value from your test cases, how you ensure that your test cases are still relevant on the platform level and on the product level, okay? How do you assess and measure coverage to really know that you're getting the right uh, you know, decisions upon each and every software iteration, upon each and every build acceptance testing that you are running. This is the biggest challenge. And how I, I, I define continuous testing, and this is a definition taken from my book. Uh, you can challenge me. I was challenged a lot about this definition. I, I'm always winning. So, uh, but feel free, ask me any questions and challenge me. In my mind, continuous testing, and you won't see here any percentages of automation because it's not about the uh, capacity 
or the quantity, it's about the value. Okay, continuous testing is the ability of an organization to automate the highest valuable test cases as part of the software delivery pipeline to understand what's being impacted upon each code change, getting the, fa the fast feedback to really eliminate business risks. Okay, and what are high value test cases? High value test cases are the ones that really give you new insights, are covering the right pieces, covering all the testing types. It's not just functional, it's not just regression, it's not just API, <clears throat> it's a mix of everything, performance, accessibility, API, uh, unit, you name it, okay? Integration, load, uh, portability, the different verticals that are doing continuous testing, and they have also some validations and compliance uh, with safety standards. It all falls under the same bucket of high value tests. And it doesn't need to be, I don't know, uh, a thousand test cases or 95% of everything. It needs to be 90% or more of the high value test. And once you understand that, you can get started with implementing your strategy, understanding which tools fit your uh, needs and move forward. And when you take the previous slide and kind of put it in into kind of a pipeline diagram, and uh, this is what uh, my colleague Dan Ashby uh, will pitch a lot about, is that you need to test everything on every phase, in every stage of your pipeline. Because if you're not writing the right requirements in the planning stage, if you're not uh, unveiling all these requirements in Jira or the other user story tools that you can use, uh, you know, the audience, and the audience in this case will be the testers, the test automation engineers, will not know what they need to develop for, okay? Same goes in the shifting right area. The previous uh, comments were on the shift left, right? When you're planning, you're setting the requirements, you're uh, writing the feature, the features, uh, definitions, and the requirements, and assigning the team to do the uh, early development and the early testing. But when you shift more towards the right, how do you monitor, how you make sure that everything works fine prior to production and in production from a monitoring perspective. So testing needs to be continuous. It needs to be uh, suited from a technology and uh, tool stack fit to the persona that is involved in these test cases. When you are able to do what I've just talked about in the previous two slides, you know, you can really benefit Okay, people have been talking about shift left for I don't know how, how many years, uh, and it become, became a bit of kind of an exhausting term because, okay, we get it, shift left, we need to do more in the early stages, but what's, what's, the, what's the big deal about it? When you do it right, when you do it continuously, and again, the continuous thing is the challenge here, uh, you're going to be more cost effective. You're going to fail fast and fix fast. You're going to support what you're, you're saying that you're an agile team or a feature team, okay? You can release much faster. And this is one of the objectives of agile. You can easily maintain the code as you move uh, much to the right, further from the moment you write your test code or your application code. Obviously you are losing the, the link, the connection. It's like a router, right? A Wi-Fi router. As you go uh, much far from it, the, the connection is getting lost. It's exactly the same. Thing when you are writing code and you're not testing it in the early stages and you're just touching it later on in the cycle, the link are, links are sometimes broken, the context is broken, and it takes you more time to understand what's going on. And obviously, when you shift left and do more automation, you can cover more scenarios, more types of test cases. Going back to my definition, cover more high value test cases. This is the very simple definition. I know that it's harder. Uh, to do than just say it, I understand that, but we are in a different reality right now, okay? It's not the DevOps uh, of a one decade ago. We are in a very, I would say, DevOps 2.0 or the DevOps next generation, which has a lot of automation tool, a lot of AI and machine learning capabilities. We are more skilled as engineers. We learned a lot over the past uh, two decades. So we are able to really accommodate much more within a single sprint. And we do see mature organization being able to release on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, sometimes on demand with feature flags and many more. So uh, we just need to be uh, properly adjusted. We need to be very strategic about how we build our testing strategy. 
unfortunately, you know, it, I, I, I talked a bit about, uh, you know, the uh, pink reality. Let's now look at the reality in its face and uh, understand that it's not that easy, especially when you're dealing with test automation. Test automation requires all of these very weird sentences that I put on my uh, screen. It requires the automation skill set. It requires uh, communication between testers and developers. It requires the testings to be not running in a shadow CI. It needs to run within the dev CI. So everyone is on the same page. So you can also analyze the reports much better and avoid escape defects. You need to have a, bet, a better way of maintaining the tests and the platforms under test. So are always up to date. You need to have the ability to automatically set up environments with data that is uh, as close to the production data. So you are really testing on what your end users are about to, uh, to kind of experience. You want the, the developers to expose everything that they can. So the application under test is designed for testability. And obviously, the time element here is one of the most challenging ones. And to do automation in time, you need most of these pieces to be uh, available to you. They need to match what you actually know how to do. Let's say you're giving a tester uh, um, a task to automate with Python and he's much better in JavaScript and this, the framework does not support JavaScript. This is kind of a uh, failure before even you, you started doing automation. So technology fitness uh, comes into the automation skills at fitness as well. If you put everything that I've just said and you're trying to look at continuous testing uh, in a DevOps reality, when you have feature teams and each individual, each persona has unique objectives, this is how it works in, a, in the real world, right? The SDETs are getting their own requirements from the test manager or from the R&D manager, depending on how you build your organization. The developers need to put as many user stories into uh, you know, code, translate them into code. Uh, do the pull request uh, on time, merge them into the pipeline, and get fast feedback. The business testers are in charge of auto, of uh, manual and exploratory testing. They are less automation engineers. They are not good with writing that much code. So you need to al allow them either through uh, Cucumber. Uh, I, I work for Perfecto. Perfecto has an open source BDD framework called Quantum. Quantum fits these guys, the business testers. Uh, the, the, the SDETs are feeling much more comfortable do, doing test cases with Selenium or WebDriver IO or Appium. And developers live, live, love the Cypress.io, the Espresso and XUI test for mobile because of the fast feedback. When you look at all these considerations and objectives and you look at all these mix of technologies, if you're able to mix and match these technologies to the persona skill set, you're in a very good position to ramp up automation to move much faster into your continuous testing journey and be much more successful. But it's not just the previous two slides. It's also, uh, if you remember my definition of continuous testing, is it's automation. It's all about automation of the high value test cases. And here you need to be very picky. Don't get too emotional. Don't get too attached to your test automation just because you can. You need to be very picky because whatever you automate, you need to maintain. It's yours. I wouldn't say forever, but it's yours for a um, long amount of time. So everything, uh, every time uh, a product changes or an element locator is changing, you need to go back and maintain your test code as well. So be picky. I'm not saying don't, don't automate. You must automate, but you need to automate the things that you care mostly about, the things that are easier to automate, easier to maintain, are the most commonly used scenarios or features within your application. If you have account nicknames in this uh, weird example that I put together, uh, no one is using it most likely. It's a feature, it needs to work, but you can do it manually every few releases. It's not the end of the world, okay? And be strategic about it, you know? Look at the scope of the next release, look at the technical skill set, as I mentioned earlier, the objectives, which frameworks fits, which environments you need to set up to accommodate all this test coverage, and uh, then you can be a bit more successful. I put together one case study uh, on mobile. You can take it and uh, use this template for any type of application. If it was a desktop application or a web application, 
obviously the right column will be different a bit but you get the point when you're dealing with uh, continuous testing these are the key pillars i'm talking now again on a mobile application you want to make sure that the application functionality is working so business flows and to end flows ui cost platform coverage mobile is big this is one checkbox environment conditions mobile is not uh, running on its own siloed environment it runs out outside of your network on uh, 5g or 4g sometimes it switches between wi-fi and, and 5g it has a lot of interruption and background applications you need to deal with gestures and stuff like that today we are dealing with uh, pwas and app clips and apks and foldables you've seen it in my uh, earlier slide so real environment conditions are also important in the digital landscape. So that's your next checkbox in your test strategy. And non-functional testing, security, accessibility, performance, APIs also needs to fit here. <clears throat> so when you are talking about continuous testing and automating what gives you value, you need to make sure that you are covering enough of all of these pillars. If you are just automating and saying, yes, I have 80% automation, but it's just the functionality, you don't have even 20% automation. So you need to be uh, uh, very honest with yourself and need to understand what really brings you value. And it needs to be across all these different layers of coverage. In addition to that, parallel testing. People will say, OK, parallel testing, what's the big deal? Parallel testing drives more coverage, faster execution speed. In this, both things translates to faster feedback. So it's very hard to set up environments. This is what uh, you know I see when I'm talking, I'm talking a lot with my customers and they are switching to the cloud, they're moving with Perfecto to the cloud to expedite the release cycle, to cover more platforms, web and mobile, and get the feedback much faster. If you are uh, tasked with managing a Selenium grid in-house when each and every month you have new browsers, new mobile devices, new operating systems. It's almost impossible to really keep up. And when you are just doubling on that and uh, adding 10 times uh, this amount of frameworks or platforms, it's very hard to sustain. So parallel test execution on the right test cases that I mentioned earlier that counts is key for your success. The other one is the open and integrated uh, reality. As I mentioned, you have the feature teams, you have the uh, assets, the, the developer and the business tester. You need to allow them, of course, without uh, violating any IT and security rules within your organization, but we are living in an open source reality. Your strategy needs to be also open and integrated. The team needs to be to feel independent uh, in selecting which frameworks fit their needs. It doesn't need to be sporadic. It needs to be very well based on requirements but there are so many different capabilities out there and a, a wide range of selection you need to enable your developers and your testers to choose from this list and this is i would say maybe 10 percent of the leading uh, technologies that are much much more the next uh, thing is how you build your testing pipeline and this is taken from one of my customers and when you think about this pipeline and i'm sure that many of you online are implementing uh, more of the same uh, of this uh, strategy uh, these guys are doing uh, seven concurrent pull requests a day and they have 10 minutes uh, allocated for a pull request feedback loop okay in 10 minutes you must automate right you don't have time to do manual testing in 10 minutes you need to have a very uh, efficient smoke testing uh, suite that you run in 10 minutes then you move to the noon build this is when a noon build allows you a one hour feedback and you can scale you can add more parallel executions on more platforms you can add different frameworks different types of testing so when you reach the end of the day and you're running a nightly regression of eight hours or so you already uh, gain some confidence from the earlier stages milestones to, throughout the pipeline so this is where, where automation and stability plays nicely into your strategy. If you want to take the previous slide and look at uh, a phased coverage approach, it's exactly the same as the previous slide, but you can look at how you can 
ramp up the different platforms, the, the web platforms, the mobile platforms. And I'm sorry if there are many on, online that are testing desktop or packaged application, it's probably a bit less complicated, but the majority of the, the industry, especially after the year of pandemic, have turned into digital. So they are at least uh, implementing one or more web and mobile applications. And when you are dealing with web and mobile, the, the, the market is so huge. There are so many configurations of mobile devices and operating systems across different geographies, different networks, different application types, as I mentioned earlier. So you need to really, when you're talking about shifting right, you need to really shift right the scale as well and really more content into the regression cycle, but you need to gain the confidence starting from the local dev team executions up until the, the smoke testing and then you bring the regression and the sanity testing which happens you know a uh, few times a day up until you run the full regression but look at how many validation points you have been able to execute and this can be very easily triggered from ci command line whatever but this is a dedicated set of executions that you do so the nighty regressions are much more stable covering more more platforms and this is the only way to really scale, succeed, and avoid escape defects. The previous slide, if you take it and want to just take one uh, message out of it, you need to make sure that you are getting right both the test scenario coverage and the platform coverage. If one of them is outdated, both of them are broken, okay? You cannot run uh, the right test scenarios on an iOS 12.3, right? It makes no sense. I'm just exa exaggerating so you understand the point, but Today, iOS is on 14.5.1 and Chrome is on uh, version 90, okay? You need to test on this latest uh, environment. If you're not testing on the latest ones, you are really not really testing on what your end users are using. Vice versa, if you're testing on the right in, uh, platform, but your test cases are outdated because you didn't automate them in time, you're missing, uh, you know, the coverage and you're risking uh, uh, in having escape defects, okay? So you need to get both of these coverage aspects properly. And again, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat it a lot, continuously. The CI pipeline must be clean and green. And I don't know if you uh, got my uh, amazing uh, visual here. So I have success keys for all the right slides. So, uh, and you have them also in the giveaway. So the slides with the keys, these are the keys for success. I didn't put the keys just because I, I, I like keys. Um, Keeping the CI pipeline clean and green upon each and every execution matters, okay? Just putting junk into your J Jenkins jobs or neglecting your uh, Jenkins build acceptance testing stability, one build after the other, this is a recipe for failure, okay? I've seen a lot of times, you know, uh, you see this uh, example here, there are four failures, it's not a big deal, but this is these four failures and you see here the red marks, this, these, are, these failures, are known for a, a long while. Look at how many builds uh, happened uh, uh, or jobs uh, in the past, you know, let's say a month or so. And these are re recurring failures. You don't want to allow recurring failures. One times or two times, fine. The third time you see the same failure, please exclude it from the pipeline. Don't get used to seeing red marks, which are noise or they're not bugs or they're low priority things that you don't care about. Make sure that your CI pipeline, your jobs and build acceptance criteria uh, pipeline, sorry, is green. So when you really get a real red or a real failure, it pops up immediately and you're not missing because you haven't noticed because you're, you have so much junk flying around. And it's easy to get used to having junk flying around. Believe me, I've seen it all. Uh, you need to be very, very uh, strategic about it. You need to have a process that cleans up these uh, reports from, er uh, from errors and noises, so you really focus on what matters. By the way, if you're not doing that, you're also losing money, okay? And you're losing a lot of money. This is just some kind of a very basic calculation of uh, a, a build or a job that has 90% stability, just 10% flakiness, okay? Look at how much money it costs you uh, per week or per build when you're not paying attention to build and code stability. 900 minutes a week can be lost. 50 bucks per build 
could be lost and depending on how many bills you have, right? And how many engineers are using that. But it can be a lot of money to the, to the business if you're not paying attention and not keeping your CI CD pipeline clean and green. Okay, and you can actually apply this math and see how much you are actually spending on your uh, bills and uh, organization yourself. If you don't know what to look for, uh, this is a problem, but I can help. So if you're, uh, you're seeing consistent failures and the failures may not be bugs, can be just noise and flakiness, you need to exclude and debug them after the second failure. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with having one failure, maybe it was a glitch, the second time, this is a red flag. You need to make sure that you are excluding, debugging it. You need to make sure that your scripts are, you know, very, very solid. Okay. You need to anticipate or eliminate if you can't anticipate things like pop-up notification, elements which are changing. You know, we have platforms and frameworks that developers are using, like React Native, right? React Native does not does not provide a consistent object identificator, uh, element locator, if you like. This is hard to automate because of that. But still, you need to make sure that you are eliminating the risks of an unstable test execution, uh, taking care of pop-up and security alerts, platform-specific things. You know that this uh, version of device or a browser are always flaky. Make sure that you are taking them aside, running them outside of the CI uh, job, just to make sure that you are able to make as stable executions as possible okay time is money and we know that do only the tests that bring the value if you see the test cases running one time after the other for two years and three years and just because they are green maybe they're not really important and they are just taking time consuming resources that you need maybe just refactor the test change some logic and make it a bit more new uh, this is how exploratory testing works but you can automate exploratory testing by really being creative in your existing test cases. After a while, the test cases become old and are not really adding value. You need to be on top of that. Monitoring the CI and platform health, I talked about it earlier, and obviously documentation, treating test code as code so you can version them, you can understand the, the history of the test. If something changed, you can revert back or uh, promote. Uh, you need to treat test code, code as code if you're not do, dealing with codeless or low code. Uh, frameworks or tools, right? When you're dealing with Selenium and other frameworks, you need to treat the test code as production code. To be successful, you also need measures. I hope I gave you enough measures on this slide. Uh, I exaggerated, I know. And by the way, in my books, you will find even more. But these are a collection of metrics that uh, some of my uh, customers have been using for the past uh, one or two years uh, when they were implementing continuous testing in DevOps. And this was helping them to understand if they are on on the right track, if they have any gaps. But again, this is not for, uh, uh, finger pointing or blaming. It's just continuous improvement. You need to know how much time the regression test takes you, how much uh, in average takes you each test execution. If it's more than five minutes, maybe these specific test cases needs to be shortened. Okay, how reliable is the automation? How much automation coverage are you doing per each type, right? This is uh, what I was talking earlier. When I'm asking people, okay, how much uh, test cases are automated? He's ten, telling me 80%, 80, 80 I say, wow, that's amazing. Are you automating performance and accessibility? No, no, it's just the functional. So it's not 80% because you're not automating everything. So you need to know what you need to automate, the tests that are bringing you, are bringing you value, but it needs to be a collection of different testing types to really cover what needs to be covered. And the CI CD pipeline health, I talked a lot about it. Uh, the matching of tools to the right persona and skill set. This is maybe a softer metric, but you can measure it as well. But it's important and it also impacts the continuous testing maturity. So I won't go uh, into each and every uh, detail here. But it's very important for you to understand that KPIs and measures really helps bring you to the next level. You can see that when you are doing everything that I've just talked about, you have the right coverage. You are doing test cases that are bringing you value. You are monitoring your reports. You are paying attention to flakiness and cleaning it. You can really reach a high feedback loop with a high stability rate, and this leads you can be only uh, in the daily release or uh, close to a weekly or bi-weekly release when you have 
90 to 99 percent stability with a very fast feedback loop the ability to analyze the data and get smart decisions so if you want to be on the right side of this maturity model you need to invest in automation that works you need to have this stability and feedback loop very solid and implemented correctly with that we have about 10 minutes uh, i made it in time so i'm going to stop sharing my slides and by the way the slides are available uh, on the uh, website and let's see if there are any questions so far um, and if you have anything that you want to ask me i hope that everyone heard what i said uh, up until now and i wasn't talking to myself uh, but if you have any questions so far i'm happy to take it now to the q a panel um, typically the questions that i'm i'm being asked uh, around are the following um, okay you say that continuous testing is all about uh, automating the right test cases that bring you value so what's the difference between continuous testing and test automation test automation is just an enabler for continuous testing okay test automation is the tool continuous testing is the strategy if you like or, or the process okay if you don't have test automation you cannot continuously test upon each trigger but test automation on its own when it's not up to date with the right coverage with the right with the right test frameworks uh, with the right platform coverage uh, with the right feedback loop obviously does not give you the value that you need upon each code change and upon each iteration so there is a distinction between test automation and continuous testing and when you uh, bake into the continuous testing uh, loop also the AI and the machine learning aspects you can really be very very efficient and drive this maturity model that I've just talked about with the 90% feedback loop and the 99% uh, accuracy or stability in your test automation scenarios with that uh, I'd like to conclude my session. If there are any questions, uh, you, or if you are shy and you don't want to ask them live right now, uh, I'm available on Slack and I'm happy to take any more questions uh, over Slack. Or um, I see that uh, there is a question, uh, uh, a new question came in. For integration testing, do you suggest to call a real environment or to use a mock server? That's a great question. If you can use a mock server, I know that implementing a mock server and maintaining it is very hard uh, there are tools across different uh, technologies there are this uh, sign on.js on the web font is very good at mocking uh, but um, as long as it's close uh, including the data uh, that you are dealing with to the real environment uh, pod, uh, production environment or the end user environment this is good okay but keep in mind that you need to maintain and invest in making the mock server as close to the real environment as possible. OK, um, but um, as a strategy, many of my organizations, you know, the biggest banks in the world uh, work with Perfecto um, and they are using a lot of mock servers. But I also know that it's not a walk in the park for them. They need to have a very good strategy. They need to maintain it all the time. They need to switch data that uh, the mock servers are relying on to make sure that it's close to the production environment but uh, that's a very cost effective way of doing things so the, the the first or the quick answer for you is yes i suggest to do it but you need to know what you're doing of course and you need to get the full support from ops it uh, dev devops uh, and other engineers in your group let's see if there are any other questions Coming in, don't be shy, feel free. I, I like to be challenged, so ask me the toughest questions, okay? And it can be not just about testing. I've been in software development uh, my almost in my entire career. So uh, if you have any other questions on software development, AI, machine learning, test automation, frameworks, whatever, feel free to, say, to ask me now or uh, via Slack. And maybe one minute before I drop, just a word, you see that I have on my shirt this uh, logo here. Um, the Perfecto solution is a cloud-based SaaS. Uh, you don't need to install anything. And this is a continuous testing platform in the cloud for both web and mobile. So you can use Selenium and Appium and Espresso XUI test and Cypress. 
to really create and execute at scale in the cloud across the globe, in Europe, in APAC, and in the US, across so many different environment, environments. So if you want to ask me more about that and why I'm wearing this nice T-shirt, uh, you can either go to perfecto.io or just drop me a note. I'll be happy to uh, provide some more information. And I see a bit more uh, questions coming in. I'm happy. Thank you for uh, engaging. Uh, the next question is, can you elaborate more what kind of test makes sense to be used for approving pull requests to main branch for build to be fast enough? Amazing question. Thank you for asking it, uh, Andrews. So uh, keeping the build acceptance testing or the pull request acceptance testing, if you like, uh, A, in time, within the time boundaries, but also very uh, specific. It needs to be obviously uh, tied to um, uh, the, the code changes that you made. So unit testing are very useful in that case. And unit testing uh, doesn't need to be the J unit of the world. I'm not talking 10 years ago. Unit testing can be even functional testing. You don't need to uh, follow them by name, OK? The fact that you are not running a J unit dash whatever and running a test on a specific lines of code uh, that is baked into your uh, uh, source code doesn't mean that it's not a unit test, OK? So uh, I wouldn't. Uh, uh be stuck on uh, uh the testing types themselves i look at the context at the scope of what you did uh, as a developer as a developer you did a pull request and you touch let's say the areas of the login functionality okay the login functionality can uh, impact abc the other apis or uh, it can vary across different different environments okay different web browsers whatever you need to look at the context and the impacted areas of uh, your code change. And based on uh, these changes, you will determine which tests you need to run. Some of the tests you might already have from the regression suite and you can borrow. OK, other tests can be implemented quite fast uh, through recording or Selenium IDEs or other easy tools. But uh, I wouldn't uh, focus on calling the tests or uh, the testing uh, types testing names, I would only focus on the context for that, OK? But yes, uh, the point about making them suitable in the time window is obviously critical. You have, I would say, 10 to 20 minutes in the good cases. In some cases, it will be a bit longer. But uh, creation and execution takes time. So I would go for, uh, I would say, a subset of the test. But you need to touch the different contextual uh, impacted areas. Cool, cool. Uh, so I I hope I answered this question correctly. If you need more uh, um, more more insights about that, feel free to Slack me, and I'll be happy to address it. Um, before we wrap up, we have less than two minutes. If there is any immediate additional question, I'm happy to answer it as well right now. I'm giving you one more minute. Okay, so with that, everyone, uh, it was a very uh, great pleasure for me to be uh, part of the DevOps Pro Europe. I will continue to monitor the Slack channel if you have any questions or anything around continuous testing or test automation, uh, software development practices in DevOps. Please feel free to reach out. I hope to see you next time and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you so much, everyone.